All right, so here we go. Week two in our series on covenants. Last week, we talked about Adam and that covenant and the covenant that God gave to Adam. Uh, remember, the Lord God commanded the man that you are free to eat from any tree from the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the gar- of the, in the garden of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And so if you remember, we talked about that idea that we had an agreement between God and man that if kept resulted in blessings, uh, getting to continue to live in paradise. But if broken, death would enter the world. And then on top of that, we learned that when that covenant was broken, there were some other punishments that would be handed down. A woman would have difficult childbirths. Men would work by the sweat of their brow. Life would not be so easy anymore, and it would always culminate in death. So, yay for that, right? So, now, some of you may have been thinking, you know, this is all really not fair. I mean, it's not my fault Adam ate of the fruit. It is not fair that I'm stuck under this curse when I'm not the one who did it. I'm not the one at fault. Uh, But, you know, this is kind of how our life works even today. I mean, think about it like this. If, If a president or a prime minister or some other leader of a country, if that ruler declared war on another country, those people under his authority would be at war, right? I mean, you don't get to vote on that kind of thing. You can't say, well, I'm not at war, even though my country is. I mean, we are all at war. And I think, I think we all understand that, uh, that it just doesn't work that way. And, and yes, we can object to that war. We can protest that war. But you and your country are still at war. And it's kind of the same thing here that we discover with Adam. We can protest all we want. We can say Adam doesn't represent me or or you're opposed to it or rebel against it. But the fact is, folks, we are still under that covenant and death will still find you. And so we begin to see the depths of rebellion in our passage and and even following into our covenant for today and this story actually begins in genesis chapter 6 uh, but i'm going to paraphrase a lot of this because it's about three chapters long and i'm going to give you like the paraphrase of what's happening what's what's taking on we're going to pick up though in chapter 9 so if you want to go ahead and find Genesis chapter 9, and that way you're there when I get there. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk through uh, chapters 6, 7, and 8 while you find Genesis chapter 9, and we'll pick up reading there in just a bit. So as we knew from last week, uh, sin entered into the world through that one bite from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that at that moment, sin took a hold. And it wasn't long after that we had our historic account of the first murder. Then we have a bunch of posturing taking place, then more sin, and then war, and evil just took off. And it got so bad that the Lord looked down and saw how great man's wickedness was and he and how. God says his every inclination and his heart was only at evil, towards evil all the time. And so the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth. And God's heart, the Bible says, was filled with pain. And so it is at this point that God decided, you know what? I think I'm just going to wipe out all of mankind. Just wipe mankind out. Wipe the slate clean. Start over. Maybe, but in the midst of this time, in the midst of God's pain, the Bible says that Noah 
found favor in the sight of God. And that Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. And so God said to Noah, you know what, listen, I'm going to put an end to all this craziness, all this chaos, all this nonsense. I'm going to put an end to the people of this earth. The earth is filled with violence. I'm done. And so to quote scripture, Genesis 6, 3, uh, God says, I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And so God tells Noah, listen, you need to build a big boat, the ark, and all of your family and the, a whole lot of animals are going to gather on board and this historic flood is going to come and fill the earth. And the waters came and they flooded the earth for 150 days and then it was months as the water went down to recede. And after the flood waters receded and Noah and the animals emerged from the ark, uh, we read in, in Genesis 9, verse 1, that God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Now, now we get to the covenant part, the part that we're going to work through today. Uh, we find that in Genesis chapter 9, and I'm going to start in verse 8. Now, as we read this, remember the four parts of a covenant that we talked about last week. Those four parts. Number one, it's a binding agreement. Two, between two parties. Three, with some form of ritual or oath that ratifies it. And four, with curses for disobedience and blessings for obedience to that covenant. And you will notice probably this week that there is something a little bit different in this covenant. Remember last week I said these are vague definitions that I'm giving you here uh, so that that way we can include all of them. And I know it makes it a bad one, but still you, uh, you'll understand more of what I mean when I read this covenant of God with Noah. And so let's go ahead and read Genesis chapter 9. And I'm going to start in verse 8. Chapter 9, verse 8 of Genesis. It says, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on the earth. So here we go. A binding agreement, right, between two parties. And, and who are these parties? Uh, we, have, we have God on the one hand, and the other party is every living creature on earth. All right? So the the, part, the parties are God and every living creature on the earth. Okay, so here comes the agreement part. The agreement part in, in verse 11. It says this, I establish my covenant with you. Never again, here we go, never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So there's the agreement. No flood to wipe out the earth ever again. Good news for us, right? With the two parties, God and all of the living creatures on the earth. Okay, so how about a ritual or oath to ratify it? Well, it's more like a sign, right? Look at verse 12. Verse 12, here's the sign. And God says, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. Verse 13, I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth 
and the rainbow appears in the cloud, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will waters become a flood to destroy all life. Verse 16. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. So there we go. The covenant between God and all living creatures on the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that this is just an absolutely amazing covenant. It's a beautiful covenant. Bore out in love for the life that God created. Especially when we, when we back up into chapter 8. In chapter 8, we see Noah and his family uh, as they emerge from the ark. And, and Noah, uh, look at verse 20. Look at uh, eight, chapter 8, verse 20. Let's go back a little bit. Uh, look at what this says. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And 21, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though, listen to this, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. It goes on to say in verse 22, As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. And so think about this. I mean, here is God who created mankind in his image, right? And it's designed to be this beautiful personal relationship between God and man. And yet his image, these little image bearers are a horrible, nasty, rebellious lot whose every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And yet it is into this context, into this sinful and rebellious state, that God breathes life, right? He, he looks at these creatures and he says, listen, I am making a covenant between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. Listen, never again will life be cut off by floods. Never again will I send a flood to destroy the entire earth, even though your every inclination is bent towards evil. I mean, it's an amazing covenant, an amazing promise. I mean, and, and really, let's, let's really try to plumb the depths of this a little bit more because I think it gives us a little more insight into who God is because I think I think this could really hit home for us when we think of our own children. I mean, our children, we look at them and, and they're our own little image bearers, aren't they, right? I mean, we see pieces of ourselves in them, in their physical attributes, sometimes in their personal attributes, right? That little stubborn streak that they get from their mother. Uh, we, we see our progeny often as a reflection of ourselves and our spouse. And so we understand the pain that can come if or when they lie to us or when they betray us 
or just choose to ignore wise counsel. Oftentimes, you're left just sitting back and praying that nothing serious happens to them. It hurts. It's frustrating. But sometimes there's not much more you can do but show love. And now I imagine how God feels about us. When Genesis 8, 21 reminds us that every inclination of our hearts are evil from childhood. We're constantly at odds with God. We constantly fail Him. But yet at the same time, He still loves us deeply. He still desires a relationship with us. He still longs for us to return to Him. No matter what we've done, And God makes a covenant to never again wipe out all living creatures because of his unimaginable love for us. I want to finish this up with with two things for you. First, uh, and you may have noticed that this covenant is a little different. This one, if you don't have a reward Uh, I mean, this one, we don't have a reward in obedience, a reward for obedience and a curse for disobedience. If you notice that, there really wasn't any of that going on here. And, And I'm going to assume that this is because this covenant is a little bit different. This covenant has nothing to do with the living creatures. And what I mean by that is if you remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam had to do his part, right? He had to avoid disobedience. This curse or reward was conditional on Adam's actions, on his obedience or disobedience. However, this covenant, this covenant is unconditional. This covenant looks at God's actions irregardless of what humanity or any living creature for that matter, does. God says, look, I know you're an unruly bunch. I know that, as it says, every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. I understand that. But even so, I will not reflood the earth again. It says, never again will I, will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. God's covenant is apart from any actions by the living creature. And so that's the first thing I wanted you to catch on this. Oh, and I almost forgot, uh, does this covenant still apply to us today? And the answer is yes. Yes, it does. So the last two uh, covenants have applied even for us today. Don't worry, there will be some coming that may or may not apply, so stick in, stick with us and stay tuned for those. Uh, the second thing I wanted to bring up before we close, the second thing I want to mention is again, that in this passage, we discover yet again a New Testament truth. Remember last week I mentioned how we can discover New Testament truths through Old Testament truths covenants. And well, again, we find it here in this passage. We find a foreshadowing of a New Testament truth from this Old Testament covenant. And let me read a little bit from the Apostle Peter. Give me a second. I should have marked this. First Peter, here we go. First Peter, um, chapter 3, 18 through 22. It says, For Christ died for sin once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Now, let me stop there for a second. Remember we said earlier, God is a God of love who desires a relationship with you. And we are going to learn as we get into this series a little bit further how serious 
God was to reconcile this destroyed relationship. Uh, that even though the every inclination of our heart is evil from childhood, God loves us so much that he was willing to send his own son to die for us. And that is what this is saying. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous Christ for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, through whom also he went and preached the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved. Ah, this is interesting, isn't it? Um, were saved through water. Verse 21, And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand, at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. You see, Peter draws into this, this parallel between Noah and his family being saved from the destructive flood by the ark, and he ties it into us being saved from the destruction of death by the sacrifice of Christ. And baptism being that symbol of salvation. And relating back, so we've got the water in there too. So remember last week, I said, God is not surprised by what happens, right? I said, God is not, not, uh, God is not filled by our actions. He's not fooled, sorry, he's not fooled by our actions. And as we see these covenants unfold, we begin to see this, uh, this, this beautiful tapestry that's lovingly knitted together by a God who loves us. We begin to see that there is a method in this madness. And next week, next week as we continue to look at these covenants, we will begin to see God drawing creation back to himself. But until then, remember, God is not surprised by what's going on. God is still in control. And remember from this week, remember that God loves you. Even in the depths of our sin, even when every inclination of our heart is bent towards evil, God still loves you and wants a relationship with you. Let's pray this morning. Almighty Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, just learn more about your covenants that show us over and over again your immeasurable love for us. God, please continue to be with us this week as we walk in this world, as we face the chaos and just the uncertainty of each day. Breathe your love into us so that we may share it with the world. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks. God bless. Have a great week. And we'll see you again soon.